Okay, so this is about where we left off. Uh, we were talking about antibacterial drugs. Uh, there were a bunch for you to learn. We talked about other things like resistance, how our resistance emerges, and um, about superbugs, and a few other things around antibacterial drugs. And uh, like I said, this is the biggest group of drugs uh, that you're going to find uh, for, uh, for antibiotics because uh, uh, bacteria are just so different. And so there's many opportunities for targeting these things. The other groups uh, are much smaller. Uh, and uh, I kind of just have a few examples. Uh, for antivirals, actually, I have about four examples, uh, partly because they're uh, really important therapeutically, uh, but there really are only maybe 12 classes of antiviral drugs, something like that, maybe 15. I know the last couple of years, there's been quite a lot more research, um, partly because of Ebola, partly because of uh, COVID-19. But honestly, I don't think they've actually come up with any new classes. It's just basically the same old classes, but new compounds. I'll show you what those classes look like. Uh, so really, uh, if you take a look at antivirals, there's kind of two things that people are looking at, maybe three things, depending on how you count it, right? Uh, one is we're looking at things that fall into the category of, um, of nucleoside or nucleotide analogs. And I'll show you what that means in a minute. Uh, but uh, there's a, a bunch of drugs like that. And, uh, and uh, I would say this probably is two thirds, three quarters of the antiviral drugs out there fall into this category. And uh, partly because you can develop drugs for one virus, let's say it's uh, developed for Ebola and now it's been repurposed and it works on let's say um, SARS-CoV-2. Uh, and that's the case with one of the examples that I'm gonna give you today, uh, remdesivir. Uh, Class B is uh, basically drugs that find something else that's unique to that virus. And every virus has something usually a little bit different on it that's going to be unique to it. And I'm going to give you, I think I have two examples that I'll show you uh, here today. Uh, so let's take a look at these, okay? Uh, first one are nucleotide, nucleoside analogs. So these are the components of DNA and RNA, right? And so you probably know you've got the genetic code, you've got the A, T, C, and G. And uh, if you look at the chemical structures, there's things like phosphate groups and uh, pinto sugars and things like that, right? And so uh, what you do are these, uh, these analogs are basically chemical compounds that are similar to the actual nucleotide or nucleoside, okay? There's a difference between the nucleotide and nucleoside, by the way, I'm not gonna go into that. You can look it up if you want, not important to this class. Uh, so if you take a look at this one here, uh, um, acyclovir, uh, it, uh, it looks like guanosine, right? So that's the G from the genetic code, but it's not quite the same. But in terms of the size of the structure, it's very similar. Uh, in terms of its binding properties, um, it's kind of similar. But the difference is, is that this guanosine um, binds certain viral polymerases very tightly and does not bind human polymerases very well. So the, um, uh, when you look at the viral uh, um, complements, uh, a lot of them have their own RNA polymerases or DNA polymerases and whatnot, and uh, they're different from the human ones. And so basically these drugs were mostly found through screening where they uh, discovered, okay, this one seems to bind the viral enzymes really well, and the human ones not so well, and eventually they became therapies. Uh, so this one here, acyclovir, um, maybe the most prescribed antiviral medication. I'm not entirely sure what the stats are. At least at one point, it was number one. And uh, you can see it's mentioned here that it's uh, often prescribed for herpes infections. So we're talking about uh, not just genital herpes, but cold sores and often found in topical creams and, and things like that. Um, there are uh, a whole bunch of, uh, this one's been around for a while. So there's a whole bunch of different uh, names for it. And uh, I don't know if you end up talking about this in your pharmacology class, but drugs, a lot of them have awful names. Um, and uh, sort of what is going on here, right? So the names for these things, they'll often have a, an official name, they'll have brand names, and sometimes the brand names will be different in different countries, and it just gets confusing. And often what goes on in the pharmaceutical industry is, is if you have a name for a compound, um, it has to go through an approval process. And part of the approval process is the name can't be a word for something else, right? So 
So that kind of limits us, right? Like if you have a new drugs for herpes, you can't just call it herpes drug or something like that, right? But so what they do is, is they kind of, sometimes they're kind of clever. So you can see herpex, right? So that was approved. Um, so you're not using an official word. You're giving people a message of what it might actually be used for. Um, and the other thing they have to think about is they, they don't want words that uh, maybe mean something uh, weird in another language, right? So they go through a lot of the major languages, you know, English, French, Spanish, Arabic, whatever, right? And, uh, and so sometimes they end up with words that are just like they random letters, and that's literally what they're doing. They're just testing it. Does that roll off the tongue? How does that sound? And, and so that's kind of part of these words are just, like I said, weird. Uh, some make a little more sense than others, right? So if you think of a drug like Viagra, right? Um, that was actually kind of a brilliant naming. It kind of, you know, is giving this idea of, uh, you know, vitality almost and, you know, something like that, right? And um, so, like I said, sometimes they come up with good ones, sometimes they come up with weird ones, like Zovarax. I don't know, doesn't mean anything to me. Um, actually had sort of, um, I can't remember, maybe I was telling you this story earlier on in the semester, I can't remember now, um, when we were talking about the papillomaviruses, uh, I had mentioned um, that my son had these warts uh, between his toes and his toes were rubbing and the warts just like, they really got out of control. So they tried, you know, the old methods where they add the acid and, and he came home a few times and was limping for two days and it just wasn't working. So eventually they prescribed, um, I can't remember which version of, um, of acyclovir. And uh, my wife came home and she's like, God, they prescribed us herpes medication. I'm so embarrassed, but it's actually a pretty common topical uh, antiviral medication, um, not just for genital herpes, but like I said, for other kind of uh, other infections. So pretty common. Um, commonly prescribed drug. Uh, I think it's mostly for DNA viruses, but I'd have to look that one up. Uh, there are many, many nucleotide, nucleoside uh, analogs out there. Um, and some of the most famous ones that are talked about, or at least the ones that are making a lot of money, uh, are the ones that were developed for uh, HIV. Uh, so this one here, AZT, you can see it looks for thymine, it looks like thymidine. Um, this was actually the first um, drug to be used to treat HIV infections. So HIV emerged uh, uh, most places in the 1980s. And um, I think this drug came out something like 1991 or, or early 90s anyway. And uh, up until then, getting an HIV infection was a death sentence. Uh, basically, uh, you knew once you started getting ill, um, you know, there was a timeline and you would eventually die from it. Uh, and so this was revolutionary, this particular drug, uh, AZT, which is azitothymidine, right? And so um, and th this was great. Uh, this one here has side effects. And since then, um, there have been, I, I don't even know how many HIV medications there are now, uh, but they're all, uh, many of them are nucleoside analogs, right? And some of them have a, a lesser side effects. Some are tolerated better by the by digestion and, and so on. Uh, so I don't think this one is very commonly used anymore because because there are better ones with um, uh, less side effects. I thought I had another one there I was going to show you, um, but uh, but that's a good one to know because it's kind of like I said, classic textbook sort of uh, sort of drug. You can see there's the uh, the the, the uh, brand name Retrovir, right? So you may remember that um, HIV is a retrovirus. So you know they're trying to use some words in there to have somebody recognize what it is, right? Uh, whether it's the uh, person prescribing the drug or not. So uh, these reverse transcriptase inhibitors, um, sorry, these nucleoside analogs are sometimes also called reverse transcriptase inhibitors when we're talking about HIV, right? Because you may remember that in HIV, the polymerase is called reverse transcriptase. So if you remember what that reverse transcriptase does, this is way back in topic six. I know it was a while ago. It takes the viral RNA and it makes uh, it eventually makes double-stranded DNA from it. So this is this is a polymerase. It's it's uh, adding nucleotides to one another, and this is the target uh, for these enzymes. So sometimes those terms are used interchangeably, but like I said, usually it's a bit more specific when you're talking about HIV. Uh, but the the bigger um, kind of category of compounds is just nucleotide or nucleoside uh, analogs. 
So there we go. It's basically blocking these steps here. Oh, I, there we go. I knew there was another one up here. Um, so this is a newer one uh, that uh, apparently has less side effects uh, in terms of, uh, like I think digestion was one of them. Uh, with the AZT, um, there was, uh, it was actually really difficult to use initially because you had to, I think, uh, take it on an empty stomach and it had to be taken at very precise times to get a certain concentration in the blood and, and it was very finicky that way. And that's really hard to get people to do, right? Rather than just saying, take three times daily kind of thing. Uh, so a lot of these newer drugs um, are a little bit better for, for those kind of things. But this is another one you can see, uh, didanosine, it looks like uh, adenosine and uh, uh, very similar and, and same idea. It's binding the viral enzyme efficiently and not binding any of uh, our human polymerases uh, efficiently. So that's kind of what you're looking for. Like I said, there's a whole bunch of these out now and uh, they're, they're all, uh, all nucleoside, nucleotide analogs. So I wanna show you one that's been used for, um, for SARS-CoV-2, COVID-19 treatment. Um, there's actually a whole bunch of uh, drugs and treatments kind of in the pipeline. Uh, trying to remember, I think last time I looked, there were something like 26 in various stages of, uh, of approval uh, in Canada and probably who knows, hundreds more in, in various stages of development. Uh, but there's only been one that's actually been approved for um, a full approval, right? It doesn't mean that some of those other ones aren't being used um, uh, because they are. Uh, but in terms of full approval for this actual therapy, uh, it, uh, you know, that takes a little bit of time to get through. And the, the one is remdesivir. Uh, so this is what remdesivir looks like. And if you take a look at that, you're probably looking and thinking, hey, that's another nucleotide. And, and it certainly is. Uh, this one here was actually developed not too long ago uh, as a drug uh, to be used to treat Ebola. And, um, and this is kind of something that happens uh, sometimes. Um, particularly when we have new viruses or whatever, um, it's like, okay, we have some antivirals, let's, let's see what works, right? And so, you know, these things get screened and, um, and this one here uh, seemed to be uh, somewhat effective. Uh, again, um, I'll get into the effectiveness in a minute here. So by the way, remdesivir is a prodrug. I wanna ask you about a prodrug. You'll probably learn about this in pharmacology, but what happens is a lot of drugs uh, or even chemicals we take and then our body modifies them. Uh, sometimes in the liver, sometimes in other parts of our physiology, uh, the chemicals will, will do things, right? And, and they change. And so this produg gets turned into this thing, right? So GS441524, I, I, don't, I don't know why somebody named it that, but this is basically the nucleoside analog, right? Um, and so it's uh, basically the same way all of these nucleoside analogs work is they're binding some sort of polymerase. So if you take a look at this, here's the, uh, the virus, it's going in there. And um, eventually uh, there's uh, an RNA replication process. And this is the polymerase here, which is uh, RDRP. Um, you can blame the geneticists. Geneticists are famous for naming things in code and uh, kind of drives me nuts. But anyway, it's just a nucleoside analog. Um, so how effective is this thing? Um, okay. Uh, it, it's one of these things that here's the problem with antiviral drugs, okay? Um, if you have something like HIV that's chronic and long-term, um, then they can be quite effective. So you're trying to keep that virus under control in the long-term uh, process, right? Something like remdesivir, uh, when you're looking at an acute, so I mean by acute, I mean a short-term infection. If you look at the viral load in someone who has uh, the SARS viruses, it's, it's several days right, you know, four to 10 days kind of thing, right? Um, so often the problem is you get the virus and uh, with SARS-CoV-2, it's actually a few days before you even realize you have it and you might show symptoms. So maybe you don't show symptoms till let's say day four or five. At that point, the viral load is high, you're sick. By the time you get treatment, the viral load is actually on its way out. And so the drug is almost pointless, right? So the, the point is it's reasonably effective if you get it into somebody early enough and the other problem with remdesivir is it's intravenous only. So really kind of you're looking at that scenario where somebody gets sick, uh, they're in the hospital and we're giving to them and uh, hoping it's gonna work. And if it's kind of later on in the infection cycle, the effectiveness is, is not so good. And this is the problem with a lot of antiviral drugs is like I said, with acute infections, um, you know, they're more effective the, the earlier you give it to the person and it's almost 
better to give it to the person before they get sick, right? So, you know, that's kind of the problem. We're not going to just prescribe all these drugs to everyone and, and, uh, in anticipation of them getting sick. Uh, but it is something. It is something that uh, that uh, is being used in Canada. And like I said, it's the only approved, um, a fully approved SARS-CoV-2 drug. Uh, even though there are several others that are are uh, in the process of being repurposed and are being prescribed, that's something that healthcare practitioners are allowed to do. They are allowed to prescribe things off-label, meaning um, uh, against its intended use, if there is uh, sufficient evidence um, to suggest that they can do that. Right? That's an unethical thing. Uh, if you think it's going to work and you have a reason to believe so, because the regulatory process takes a long time, uh, physicians are allowed to do that kind of thing. Uh, sometimes they get in trouble too, right, for going off label. Um, if if other experts agree it was actually a bad thing to do, and that's you know that's part of the whole whole industry. Okay, so that's a nucleoside nucleotide um, analogs. That was the first group. Like I said, you're looking at inhibiting um, these polymerases, of which most viruses have at least, you know, might have one, right? And uh, and so, you know, it's a valid target. If you can just find a compound that binds the viral enzyme better. Um, there are a bunch of other viral enzymes and proteins, um, and often they're a little bit more unique to the specific viruses. I'm going to give you two or three examples here uh, today to show you uh, uh, some of the things that are being used. Um, and uh, so the first one is... Um, one of the, uh, uh, this one was really famous in 2009 when we had the last pandemic with H1N1. Uh, it's called Tamiflu. It was a relatively new drug at the time. And so the thought was that there wouldn't be any viruses that would be resistant to it, right? That's always a good thing. And um, um, so, so what does it do? Uh, Tamiflu, if you take a look, so, so this is the influenza virus, right? So you might get from the name that it's a flu drug, right? So this is the influenza virus. If you remember that we had the H1N1, so H is a hemagglutinin, N is neuraminidase. So the hemagglutinin is a part of the, the uh, binding process, right? So the virus has this, this protein on the outside, and that binds, um, you know, in the case of humans, our respiratory cells. And the neuraminidase is actually a surface protein that kind of helps with the virus budding and escape. So if you take a look, here's the... Um, uh, the budding virus is trying to escape, and the neuraminidase actually kind of just trims it and lets it go, right? So I kind of think of it as if, you know, you had a helium balloon, and uh, somebody just comes along with scissors, and the helium balloon is a little virus escaping, right? So the, um, the neuraminidase inhibitors uh, stop that. So it doesn't prevent the cell from getting infected, but then it prevents other cells from getting infected. So there's, there's some questions, again, about how effective Tamiflu is, because it's that same issue of, uh, you know, if you get the flu, by the time you have symptoms, you're kind of halfway through the virus cycle, and you're probably on your way to getting better. Um, there's some indications, again, that uh, the sooner it's prescribed, the, the better it is. And uh, I was actually talking to a friend of mine about Tamiflu and, uh, and uh, asking him, you know, what his thoughts were. He's, he's a physician. And he was saying, yeah, I've read some of the studies, and, and it may not be that effective. Um, but he actually prescribes it quite regularly for two reasons. One, um, you know, if there's a chance that it might help the patient, particularly somebody who is severely ill, uh, then it's, you know, the ethical choice is you, you give them the therapy that is, that is available, right? And number two, um, a lot of patients, you know, are demanding antibiotics when they have the flu. And that's a problem. Right? We don't want to be give, prescribing them antibacterial drugs. Uh, so in some cases, it's, it can be easier to um, you know, prescribe them antiviral. Like I said, uh, it's, uh, it's one of those things, this problem with, with a lot of antivirals with faster, shorter infections. By the time you know, somebody is most way through, uh, that's the time they might actually see, be seeing uh, going to a clinic. Okay, so uh, like I said, other unique proteins, um, HIV, it turns out, has another unique protein called a protease. And uh, so there's a few HIV drugs out there that are protease inhibitors. And I have a little video I'll show you here in a second. There's a whole bunch of weird names for them. I can never remember these names here. One, uh, saccharid, Ninivir, like, I mean, it's just, let's just throw some letters together, right? Uh, and this one apparently is used in, in hepatitis uh, C as well. And again, some interesting chemical compounds. 
So I'll, um, I'll just explain briefly what it does, and I'll show you. I have a one-minute video uh, as well that kind of shows uh, what's going on with the HIV life cycle. This part I kind of I, I kind of skipped over earlier on in the semester in terms of the HIV life cycle. This is it's, uh, but it is important. So HIV does something kind of weird um, that that humans don't do. Um, you can see it says here, uh, you know, when we make our proteins, we kind of just make them one at a time. Uh, HIV actually makes one really long protein strand. And so it kind of looks like this. And then there's this uh, protease that actually trims them and, and each of those will fold up and become individual proteins. So they're there, they're folding up and, uh, and then eventually it, it makes a, a mature uh, virion, right? Uh, the protease inhibitors kind of block, they block this step here, there we go. So the virus has uh, infected a cell, but there's a point where it can't mature properly. So like I said, I have a little video here I'll show you uh, and uh, kind of goes through uh, that part of the life cycle and, and shows you how these work. Yeah. Like with the viral infection? Um, that's a good question. Uh, and part of it has to do with, um, um, it's not actually treating the, the virus. Uh, the steroids are uh, usually to kind of uh, tame the immune system a little bit, right? So in the case of like um, uh, COVID-19, right? Um, you know, some people are ending up with lungs flooded with fluid and, uh, um, you know, those kind of secondary infections. So, so usually they're not looking at giving them steroids early on in the infection. It's sort of uh, closer to week two, particularly if they're having long, long COVID because you're looking at uh, side effects from inflammation and immune reactions. So something just to usually tame the immune system down a little bit, right? Um, and uh, there was some debate with, with COVID-19 at the beginning because there was like one small study that showed steroids didn't help. And a lot of physicians were like, but wait a second, we're seeing inflammation in these patients. And so eventually well, other studies were done and they realized, yeah, okay. So I think it's about day six, day seven, they start considering if somebody is having that longer term because by then the viral load is basically gone and now you're dealing with the immune sim symptoms, which in some cases, people can have severe inflammation, which can lead to all sorts of other, other secondary issues, right? So, good question. Thank you. So I'll just play this video for you of the protease inhibitors. Like I said, it's maybe a minute, minute and a half long, and um, it kind of explains, uh, you know, what that part of the virus life cycle So when HIV buds from a cell, it's not in a mature form. Its proteins are actually in a multi-linked chain. So protease comes in and it cleaves the proteins in several different places. So the proteins undergo a conformational change. And they're actually, or actually HIV becomes mature. and the life cycle goes on. So when protease is inhibited by a medication called ritonavir, in this case it's a protease inhibitor, it binds to the active site in protease. So now it can't cleave the protein. So if it can't cleave the protein, then HIV can't become mature and the life cycle is inhibited. All right, so that's, uh, that's it. Sorry about the echo, I, I don't know. Uh, something in the setting, someday it works, someday it doesn't. Um, so as I mentioned, there's, there's a whole bunch of, um, of treatments uh, for, um, for SARS-CoV-2 kind of in the pipeline. And uh, I found this little infographic here from Viral Zone, and you can see they're looking at uh, at looking at inhibitors that are are basically targeting different stages of the virus life cycle. Kind of the key is you're trying to find things that are binding viral enzymes and uh, viral enzymes that are unique from humans. Um, we are going to talk about another treatment here uh, a little bit later. I think this is uh, when we get to the immune system. You might have heard of the monoclonal antibodies. Um, and those are not necessarily antiviral drugs. They're kind of an immune uh, thing, and we'll, we'll get to there. Um, maybe I see a question. Let's see.
So somebody's saying, yeah, if the if the cell if the um, if the virus does uh, mature before the drug is given, then yes, it will it will spread. But uh, you know that's that's going to be the case no matter what. Whenever you give the drug, there's going to be you know viruses in different stages of replication and whatnot. And so uh, you know the earlier in, in the treatment somebody can get uh, get the drug, uh, the more effective it's always going to be. Okay, so that's kind of it for antivirals. Um, there are always people trying to look for different strategies. Uh, you know these uh, like the neuraminidase uh, inhibitors. Um, you know, for every drug, people are trying to find, uh, sorry, for every virus, people are trying to find drugs that might bind those receptors on the surface. And I know there were people looking for drugs that were binding the uh, SARS-CoV spike proteins. And, and I don't think that was, that was very effective. Um, probably a few in the pipeline again, you know, maybe years from now we'll figure out uh, if something like that works. Um, but uh, the reality is, you know, we're looking at the tried and true methods which have been the, the nucleoside, nucleotide analogs. And once in a while, uh, something else pops up like those protease inhibitors or the neuraminidase inhibitors. Uh, so let's talk about antifungals. Um, there's a couple of classes of antifungals. We're just gonna talk about one class. And um, there's, uh, there's really not a ton of antifungal drugs out there. And part of the reason is that um, the ones we have are reasonably effective. And the other reason is that fungi don't tend to mutate as much as bacteria or viruses. So we have some effective antifungal drugs. And for the most cases, that is good enough. And probably the other reason is that most people who get fungal infections, they're not serious infections either. You're looking at a skin rash or something like that. And like I said, usually it's relatively effective. Uh, one of the biggest groups of antifungals are these azoles. So an azole uh, is actually this chemical structure here. So it's this five-membered ring with a couple of nitrogens on it. And uh, these ones here uh, affect something called ergosterol synthesis. So you may have heard of cholesterol, right? Cholesterol is a, uh, uh, a similar compound. It's found in, um, in animal membranes. And, uh, you know, it's found in our diet. And of course, you know, people talk about cholesterol consumption and whatnot, right? But it's actually an essential molecule for our membranes. Uh, it turns out fungi have something similar, but it's a different compound. It's ergosterol. And uh, so it turns out these azoles actually affect the synthesis of that. So if you can affect um, their membrane functioning, then you can actually kill those cells, which is really what's going on. So there's a whole bunch of these. I'll show you uh, one here. This is Diflucan. Um, again, these ones here, you know, they have so many different names um, depending on which manufacturers make them. And this one goes by Diflucan, Trican. The full name is Flucon, Fluconazole. Um, kind of hard to keep track of these things. So you should remember the word azole, okay, for this one here. And you can see there's the azole ring uh, over there on the structure and, and what, the, what the drug looks like. And there are, uh, here's another one, myconasal. Um, I saw this one, um, I was just walking through the pharmacy not too long and I saw this on the shelf. I can't remember what it was for now. Uh, maybe it was uh, athlete's foot or something like that. And uh, there's a whole bunch out here, athlete's foot, pretty common, um, uh, and, uh, fungal infection, jockey itch, just a different part of the body. And of course, uh, women do have uh, uh, yeast infections as well, right? Uh, and so same compound, uh, just different application, different uses, right? Uh, I think I see a question there. Let me check and see what it is. Sorry, I missed that. Yeah, so somebody's asking about uh, combining uh, medications for viruses at different stages. And uh, it's not necessarily different stages because, you know, we're not going to go into somebody's body and try to figure out what stage the virus is at. But uh, you'll see when we talk about HIV in more detail um, that um, uh, we do use combination therapies. And uh, often the reason for combination therapies is not necessarily to hit them at different stages, but with a virus like HIV that mutates like crazy, HIV is nuts when it comes to mutations. Uh, HIV would mutate in a month the amount of flu virus will mutate in a couple of years, right? Uh, so it's, it's just mutates like crazy. And so it can actually evolve resistance very, very rapidly. And so if we hit it with uh, on different fronts with different drugs, these combination therapies are a little bit more effective. 
Um, so we'll more on that when we get to HIV. All right, we're going to talk about the immune system and immune disorders at some point. Uh, so antifungal drugs, like I said, there's a few different classes out there. Um, you guys need to know the azoles, okay? So what about anti-protist drugs? Okay, so protist infections. Um, you know, we're looking at things like trichomonas, uh, plasmodium, which causes malaria, and, um, and a few other, other things like that. And these are eukaryotic cells. And, um, and each of them is kind of like protists are weird beasts, right? And so uh, uh, we have a, a number of drugs, not a huge amount. Um, and unfortunately, sometimes the mechanisms are kind of a little bit fuzzy, uh, especially you start reading the literature on these things and you'll see a lot of sort of speculative language in terms of the studies. And uh, part of the problem is if you look at something like plasmodium, um, plasmodium has different life cycle uh, stages, right? So we can, we can grow one stage in the lab and then other stages we can't actually culture it, right? So, you know, we can, um, there's the one stage that infects humans, for example, uh, we can culture it, but you have to culture it in mosquitoes. So think about how difficult that is. You have to have a mosquito colony, you have to have technicians that can actually dissect mosquito salivary glands. Um, it's, it's extremely complex. So to study these things, um, like I said, there's a lot of speculative language in the literature. Um, there are a few for malaria in particular, it's a drug or it's a disease that's been around for a long time uh, and has had uh, uh, serious human consequences. And uh, one of the big classes are the quinines. Uh, this one was um, uh, the quinine class. Uh, I can't remember which tree it comes from, um, but it was discovered by indigenous people in, in Central and South America. And, uh, and then the, uh, the Spanish conquistadors were like, hey, why are you, um, what are you doing with that bark when you have malaria? And eventually it was, it was uh, kind of uh, the compound was extracted that way. Um, and there's a whole bunch out there. Often they have quin in there somewhere. So like uh, mexoquin or methylquin. Um, there's a whole bunch of these out there, chloroquin. And um, they all have different stabilities and things like that. Uh, this one here, methylquin, is pretty common if you travel to, um, uh, to uh, areas in Africa. And uh, this one um, is pretty famous uh, for being um, kind of a, uh, like it's the kind of thing if you're traveling to a malarial endemic zone, um, they may get you to take the pill as a preventative measure, right? And uh, so this one here is famous because uh, apparently some people end up with like crazy dreams and hallucinations from it, right? So, you know, that's one of the side effects. Uh, not everybody, but a small percentage. Um, so I know somebody who had that, right? And, and like in my mind, like in terms of her personality, she's the kind of person that I kind of wonder like if I, you know, if I told you, you might have some crazy dreams from this, right? Whether like half of it was psychological, right? If you tell, like I said, with her personality, I was like, you know, she's the kind of person that I'm sure if you told her you might have crazy dreams, she's definitely going to have crazy dreams, right? Some people are just more susceptible kind of those suggestions and placebo kind of kind of effects, but uh, but it is a thing, right? Uh, chloroquine used to be um, prescribed more if you went to um, um, South America. Uh, I think it's kind of not prescribed very often anymore because of resistance. The malaria parasites do uh, uh, have um, again some resistance over the years to these things, but this is still probably these uh, quinines are probably still kind of the number one prescribed malaria drug in, in, in many places. Uh, there is another one that's been out for, um, don't think it's been out for 20 years, that is kind of like, like increasing in terms of its uh, a, a prescription. This one here is, our, I'm not sure how to say that, our, our temizinin. Uh, this one was kind of an interesting story. Um, and uh, there was a Nobel Prize given for it maybe three or four years ago. And uh, it was a Chinese woman. And uh, um, if you know about Chinese medicine, there's, you know, like, I don't know, let's say 10 or 20,000 roots and herbs and things like that that are used in traditional Chinese medicine, some of them more effective than others. And uh, so she went through several years of screening these things to see if there's something that worked against the malaria parasite. And this one was discovered. And uh, and now it's uh, it's becoming a standard treatment when um, when strains uh, when resistant strains are, are are discovered. So how do these things work? Um, I might have it in the notes uh, somewhere. We think these things work by disrupting 
uh, hemoglobin metabolism uh, in the parasite. So the malarial parasite, uh, eventually it gets into the body and it affects the blood and it feeds literally on hemoglobin. And so it's believed that what this drug does is disrupts that process and makes it kind of uh, um, the iron and the hemoglobin indigestible somehow. Um, again, like I said, it's kind of kind of fuzzy. It, maybe we understand better now. I haven't actually read up in about five years, but uh, it's the kind of thing that uh, you know we think that's how it works. This one here, I have no idea. I just know it's been in the news the last couple of years because it was a Nobel Prize and one of those uh, kind of interesting human stories. Um, okay, what about drugs for worms? Uh, again, there's a few out there. I'm gonna just talk about two. And a lot of them are basically paralyzing the worm. Worms are animals. They have um, primitive nervous systems. If you can inhibit those things, you can paralyze them. And often that's enough to kill them. So mavendazole is a pretty common one. It's, it's actually talking about inhibits the uptake of glucose, which is involved in uh, uh, the, uh, the neural response. And uh, it used to be kind of uh, one of the commonly one, common ones that was prescribed for uh, tapeworms. I think I told you before that guy with a tapeworm infection, it was like one pill, right? So the uh, head gets paralyzed and the worm can't hold on anymore. And then the worm um, you know, ends up going through his system. Um, one of the things with uh, with these worm infections, of course, is that it's not removing the worm. So sometimes if people are hit with a high enough dose, uh, it can lead to things like intestinal blockage or something like that, uh, which, which can be a concern. Uh, some worms are actually embedded in the skin and may require some, some sort of surgical procedure to get rid of them as well. Uh, so the one that's been hitting the news lately is this one here, ivermectin. Um, this is an anti-parasite, anti-worm drug. Um, so this one here, if you, if you have a pet and your pet has had heartworm or any number of worm kind of thing, uh, or a horse or whatever, uh, it is hugely and very commonly prescribed uh, for animals. Um, for humans, uh, there are cases where people get off the plane from visiting or, or immigrating from a warmer location and they have an infection in our so it is a human drug. Um, why is this one hitting the news? Has anyone heard about this one in the news? Yeah, I know. So this is a, a drug that paralyzes worms. It does not kill viruses. Let me just correct myself. Um, it does kill viruses. Uh, a lot of these drugs, uh, so like I said, we have a new virus out, right? And so people are like, let's just, you know, I have some cells in my lab and I'm gonna grow some viruses. Let's just hit it with whatever, right? So um, we're in the modern age of, of robotics. So you can imagine that um, what has been done uh, in several countries now is, is literally you get the SARS virus and you, you can put it in these little tiny wells and you can test 20,000 compounds. And so this is what they do. They're just like, okay, let's just test all of the, all of the antibiotics we have on the shelf because you know we only have, uh, I don't know, 30 or 40 antivirals, so why, it's just, why stop there? We've got all of these drugs that have, been, that have been approved, that they're safe for human use or whatever, and um, you know maybe we can prescribe them. And so they found, um, there was one study that showed in high concentrations, ivernectin was, uh, actually does kill the virus. No kidding. I mean, if I gave you a high concentration of nutmeg, it would kill you, right? There's a lot of compounds out there that are toxic in high concentrations, right? Uh, in terms of where the science is at, uh, the concentration that was shown in the study is enough to make people seriously ill. And for whatever reason, you know, there's whether it's political or stupidity or whatever, it just seems to have exploded where everyone wants to, to have this for SARS-CoV-2, even though the data is showing it's probably not a good idea, particularly in the concentrations that might be required to actually kill the virus. It's not an antiviral drug. Um, it's just a toxic compound. Right, so let's not inject bleach. <laughs> let's not take drugs that are not meant for their uses, <laughs> uh, and, and a bunch of other things. Right, uh, it's yeah, I don't know. This whole pandemic, uh, you know, everyone is is frustrated, and um, there's so many crazy weird things going on. I'm sure someday time travel will be invented, and some guy will drop in and be like, I don't understand what's going on. This is weird stuff. Right. <laughs> But yeah, this is a drug that kills worms, right? That's, that's it, uh, its purpose. That part is very, very well understood. 
Okay, so that's kind of it. Like I said, full whirlwind tour of a bunch of drugs, uh, kind of just targeting some ones that represent different classes. And uh, you can see this is a, a table showing that there, there is some cross reactivity to certain drugs. So if you look at this, here's the uh, antibacterial drugs on the left. You can see that some are broad range, meaning they're killing um, a variety of different organisms, both gram positives and gram negatives. Streptomycin actually kills gram negatives and tuberculosis. And there's one or two drugs that actually, you know, do move across categories. So the sulfonamides uh, works against some protists apparently. And if you remember how that works, this is uh, inhibiting uh, folic acid metabolism. So some protists, that's what they do. That's how they survive in the wild. They make their own, their own folic acid. And so of course it'll work. Uh, you've got um, some of these other drugs here that uh, have different ranges of, of effectiveness um, and, uh, and, and all of those kind of things. And then the antiviral drugs are usually their own categories. Usually these drugs are not um, affecting other things. There are some exceptions. Uh, another, another drug that, um, uh, that had hit the news early on in the pandemic was uh, um, hydroxyquinone. Maybe you've heard about that one too. That is actually an anti-malarial drug um, that does seem to disrupt some viral patterns. Uh, but for the most part, again, that's a case where a whole bunch of uh, studies were done and it seems that it actually probably does more harm than good. Uh, so there are some crossovers. Like I said, that's kind of a common practice sometimes is uh, you know when you have something new, um, you know, everyone wants to throw the kitchen sink at it. And it's worth a whole discussion about what's ethical, right? You know, you can, ima you can imagine people going into a clinic and saying to, to the doctor, can't you do something, right? And the temptation for the doctor to just prescribe something. But ethically, you shouldn't. You shouldn't throw the kitchen sink at it. You know, everyone's seen the show House, right? That guy was a nightmare. You shouldn't be just trying and prescribing everything. Right, you know, you could actually do more damage and harm to a person uh, if you're doing it irresponsibly. Right, so this is why you know there, we should have evidence-based medicine. Right, which means that some people are actually doing it wrong, and they have to be told they're doing it wrong, which can be very hard to do. And people have been doing something for, for years. So this is one thing to consider. Right, obviously, is is what you're treating. You give antibacterials to bacterial infections, antivirals to viral infections, and so on. Um, so this is kind of, uh, I think I found this on Alberta Health, right? And this is the thing that we all have to educate people. And so your job as nurses is this is going to be a big thing, right? Where people are coming in with a variety of things. And of course, everyone, they just, they, they just want antibiotics, but to give them the understanding that you can't just prescribe, um, drugs for everything. Some things you have to treat the symptoms and let the immune system, uh, let it out. Other things, antibacterials uh, are actually effective, right? So, you know, these kind of things that are, um, are bacterial in nature um, are treatable by antibiotics. These things that are viral in nature, uh, in many cases, um, I'm sorry, I thought I had a mistake on there. Um, in many cases, uh, you have to tell the person no, right? And explain to them, right, what is, what is going on. Sometimes it's the question though, right? Someone comes in with pneumonia, uh, you know, viral pneumonia or bacterial pneumonia, and that's part of uh, what they're trying to figure out with the diagnosis. And sometimes there's other clues, like if this person has a fever or not, those kind of things, but uh, more on pneumonia later. I haven't really talked about pneumonia too much. Uh, other things to consider, right? And we've kind of hinted on some of these things, right? In terms of the drugs, you know, there's a whole variety of things and I imagine you'll talk about some of these things in your pharmacology class, right? Uh, you know, oral versus IV, right? Obviously oral is desired because the person can take that and they can take it home and do it themselves. Most people aren't set up to give themselves an IV at home, right? Um, sometimes the taste, right? If you're dealing with children, um, some drugs taste bad and you can't add as much, you can add as much banana flavor as you want and the child still will not consume it, right? Uh, and this is actually an experience I had with my own son um, when he was like two. Right? Um, even the pharmacist said, what is this guy doing? You don't prescribe this to two year olds. He won't, he won't drink it. And, and sure enough, he wouldn't. So I had to go back for a different prescription. That's kind of frustrating, right? Um, other things, toxicity, uh, allergies, all those things are important. 
Uh, some things you can't give to uh, people with certain conditions, you know, with uh, older people, uh, sometimes you're a little more worried about liver damage uh, and those types of toxicities and so on. Children versus women, pregnant women, of course, you know, a whole other story where you're dealing with uh, uh, a concern about uh, uh, toxicity to the fetus and those kind of things. And uh, something else is cost, right? Uh, you know, and this is something that comes up once in a while. You guys are students. And um, I don't know whether you have a student drug plan or not, but sometimes student drug plans can be extra stingy, right? They will cover cheap and generic drugs, but they won't cover the more expensive newer drug, for example. And so, you know, you go in for something routine like an ear infection and the doctor prescribes you this thing and you find it's not covered by the drug plan. And so they have to, you have to go back and get, a, you know, rather than getting the $80 drops, they'll give you the, you know, the other ones will be covered and whatnot. Um, we're going to talk about this normal flora stuff. And I kind of had mentioned a little bit before with uh, people taking, uh, let's say, antibiotics, they have pneumonia, you take an antibacterial drug, and uh, this disrupts um, the normal complement of uh, bacteria in your body, and, uh, and you may get a yeast infection because now the yeast has a chance to thrive because the bacteria have been limited. So more on that um, in topic 12. We're going to get to talking about flora in a bit more. Okay, so where are we? I think that may actually be the last slide. Um, it is. Uh, so just a reminder that the midterm covers up to there. Okay, so topics seven to ten. I've had a couple of people ask me about the midterm and you know how much is covered in the previous topics. I'm not going to. I'm not looking at the previous topics to ask you questions, um, but I'm assuming you do have some basic knowledge, right? We're talking about let's say you know HIV right now. We we're just talking about reverse transcriptase. Right. I'm not going to ask you anymore what reverse transcriptase is because that was kind of covered in the first midterm or the first six topics. But I might ask you about reverse transcriptase inhibitors. So if you if you have some gaps in your knowledge, that's not it's gonna, it, um, not going to be helpful. Uh, so if there are some gaps from topics one to six, spend a little bit of time on there, maybe reviewing, um, but not too much time. Okay, you want to be focusing on topics seven to ten. So any questions about the midterm? Still working on it. It's been a crazy busy last couple of weeks. All right, so 11.19. So we're going to start topic 11 and uh, kind of transition to more um, the disease part of the course. Okay, so let me change the PowerPoints. <laughs> Question, which midterm do people usually do better on? Um, depends on who you are. Uh, I think the material in midterm two is harder, but the average uh, the average grade does seem to go up a little bit, maybe a percentage point or two. Um, I would say uh, typically after the first midterm, um, I have a certain number of people kind of in that risk zone of, you know, they're hovering around the C and, you know, you want the C plus, right? And I would say after the second midterm, um, usually more than half of them are able to boost their mark and get into a safer, a safer zone. Okay. Um, but I'm not going to make any promises because it's all, it's all over the map. Some people are consistent as, as they could be. Uh, some people, you know, they get the boost. Other people, uh, you know, life happens and, and you just, you don't do as well. Um, another question there. Huh. What is the average? Can't remember. Um, and I remember the average in the first midterm? 69? Yeah, so let's say it goes up to 71 or something, right? Uh, that's probably pretty typical. I'd have to look it up. Okay, so topic 11. Uh, like I said, the last part of the course here, we're going to talk a little bit more about disease in terms of our interactions with these organisms. So that includes things like uh, disease transmission. Uh, it includes um, um, interaction of, the, of these, uh, these organisms, you know, the, the whole question of why is it that this particular organism causes disease and this one here does not? Or why is this, you know, why, why is it that this one here um, causes disease today and tomorrow it does not, right? So those kind of questions we're going to get to in the next few minutes. We're going to talk about the immune system, 
And uh, we're going to eventually going to talk a little bit more about body systems as well. So topic 11 is epidemiology and disease transmission. And uh, this is something that uh, um, actually has been kind of in the news a lot with the pandemic, you know, because of course everyone's talking about numbers, right? And people want to debate about numbers and whatnot. But data is important. Here's some data, right? Top 10 causes of death in high income countries. So this is where it gets interesting when you start looking at, okay, what's missing? What about the other countries, right? So lower income countries, take a look at this. So higher income countries, top 10 death, lower respiratory infections are in the top 10. That's only infectious disease. Everything else here, heart disease, stroke, those kind of things. Uh, lower income countries, you can see we're starting to look at tuberculosis, HIV, uh, diarrheal diseases. Um, infectious diseases are um, a bit more of a thing, uh, particularly uh, with your mortality, right? So this is kind of a little bit of epidemiology, right? Looking at numbers and looking at trends. Uh, Here's another uh, set of graphs. Uh, you can see this one here is looking at Lyme disease cases. So there's, there's kind of two graphs here, right? One is showing that the number of cases do seem to be increasing over time. And the other one is showing diseases with the months. So this is the kind of thing that if you didn't know how Lyme disease was transmitted, um, there's some useful data here, right? So take a look at this, right? We're looking at, you know, June low, and then suddenly July and August and later parts of the year, it's really high. So, you know, what's going, you know, the first question is what's going on in the summer months, right? And we have warmer weather, um, that just has something to do with going to the beach. Um, is the pathogen uh, uh, persistent in the environment uh, and, it, and it's susceptible to freezing? Um, you know, so this is the beginning of those questions, right? Looking at that data. How's Lyme disease transmitted? By tick, yeah. So the ticks aren't out in the winter, right? And uh, so, you know, this data is used to kind of look at patterns and uh, uh, try to understand what we can do about it, right? So you can see up at the top, it says here, epidemiology is the study of causes, distribution, effects of disease, and other health-related issues. And you could extend that sense to say, and looking at intervention um, strategies, right? So, you know, if you see a pattern, what can we do to fix it? I'll give you another example, a little bit more specific, uh, something that uh, healthcare uh, people in Alberta have been trying to figure out what to do about this for at least 10 years now. So take a look at syphilis infections in Alberta. They have been skyrocketing. I have the data, you can go back um, even further in the data if you want to. Um, but around 2010, um, we started to see some cases go up, right? Uh, and uh, you can see every year it's, it's been going up. And we're at the point now in Alberta, um, they've realized looking at the numbers that th this is the worst uh, we've had it uh, since the 1940s, right? So this, this is a concern. Um, and uh, we don't have all the data for 2021 yet, but you can see the data from the first, uh, first quarter of the year. Uh, we're on a trajectory to, to blow past this 2,500 cases. Um, and there, there's a lot of information from this, and I'll show you uh, some of the information that, that's, uh, that's come out of this, right? Um, one third of cases uh, are from people that are having sex with anonymous partners um, using dating apps and, and social media type, type things, right? Um, so that's, that's one piece of data. And so uh, there is evidence to show that this kind of thing has increased in the past 10 years, probably no surprise there. Uh, about a quarter gay and bisexual men. Um, okay, so that's, that's something to think about. Uh, they didn't say what they meant by a disproportionate amount amongst Indigenous people. Um, they didn't really clarify what disproportionate meant, but, uh, but that is a concern. Um, injection drug users, okay? Um, and 15% cases are in pregnant women. Okay, so this is, this is uh, important because, of course, you know, um, we do want to protect those babies, right? And uh, congenital syphilis. Syphilis is one of those uh, organisms that can actually go through the placenta and infect the fetus. And so this can actually um, kill the child, right? And so here's the numbers here. Uh, it's not a huge number, but it's a lot more than we want it to be, okay? So, you know, epidemiologists, you know, they and health officials, public health, they're looking at these, these things 
And uh, one more stat, two thirds of the cases are in Edmonton. Okay, so they don't know why. Edmonton and Calgary, kind of similar populations in some ways, you know, about a million each. Um, why are there more in Edmonton area? Um, so this is the question, right? What do they do with this data? So what are some inter intervention strategies here? What do we do? Educate the demographics. So who does that include? So probably young population. Um, and that, that's exactly what I have here. Um, more frequent prenatal testing and the vulnerable groups. I thought I had that first. So the vulnerable groups identified, right? So we had um, a gay bisexual men, um, injection drug users. Uh, uh, probably there's a bit of an overlap with, um, uh, they did not mention uh, sex work people, um, but generally that tends, there tends to be a trend with sexually transmitted diseases and an increase in cases in sex workers. So that would be a, an obvious target to, uh, um, uh, to reach out and do education and testing to, uh, and college students. And uh, I forgot to bring it actually, um, because the last time syphilis was in the news, it's one of these things, right? I see syphilis in the news and there's a syphilis outbreak and it mentioned Northern Alberta, which who knows what that meant. And I think they actually meant Edmonton in that case from, from reading the, between the lines. And I swear, I swear to you, I saw the, the, the news thing. And then the very next day, there were syphilis posters in the college, <laughs> right? And so when they were taking them down, I saved one. I was gonna bring it to class, I totally forgot, right? Um, but that is, a, that is a, a population, right? That, that would be um, uh, worth targeting uh, uh, people that may not necessarily have long-term partners yet or, or, or maybe um, engage in more risky behavior. So this is something that's been even talking about with uh, with the pandemic, things like contact tracing, right? Someone has syphilis, okay, who have you been with? We need to contact them and uh, probably get them tested as well, right? And uh, so same thing with, with pandemic, right? We're, we're trying to do some contact case tracing and that's, uh, that's a big part of it. So this is epidemiology, right? Trying to look at these patterns and understand it. Sometimes we're at the very beginning of a pandemic, you know, new virus, we're trying to understand how it's transmitted. Sometimes we're uh, having an outbreak and we're trying to understand, you know, what, what is different than five years ago. Uh, and, and there's lots of questions to ask. So some object objectives of epidemiology, right? Um, identify causes, reservoirs, and spread of disease. So we're gonna talk about some of these things like reservoirs and what those are, okay? But you know, where are these things coming from and looking at patterns? Um, help improve conditions, right? Obviously, that's kind of the main thing is we want to intervene and, and see what we can do. And uh, every situation is unique, right? You can see that uh, right now, uh, you know, um, in many parts of the world, uh, one of the interventions is, you know, this um, mandates around vaccines and, and those kind of things. And, and that's, uh, you know, that's the whole point of it is to, you know, try to, uh, you know, improve conditions, I guess, is what you can say here. Uh, reduce occurrence of disease, I guess that's kind of hand in hand. And uh, as you can see, it's talking about, you know, all the stuff that I said already, right? Looking at patterns and, uh, you know, trying to prevent, trying to intervene. Uh, sometimes it's even just learning about the disease in general, right? If you think about something like Ebola, uh, Ebola is one of those diseases that, uh, you know, we, we think it's found in bats, but it hasn't really been fully conclusive, right? Um, there's a lot of species of bats out there, right? Um, maybe 1,200 species of bats, right? Not all of them are tested. So we still don't really fully understand where it comes from in nature. And that's something part of this research is, you know, every time there's outbreaks, we're looking and trying to see where you're supposed to bats. You know, uh, maybe uh, we should look at, you know, and see if we can figure this kind of puzzle out because we want to prevent it in the future. Okay, so I have a handful of definitions for you here today. Okay, and these kind of things are thrown out um, all the time in the news when they're talking about uh, particularly last year or two. Um, so one definition is prevalence, right? So this is basically how many people are infected right now. Okay, so we could say, you know, for example, um, we could be talking about Fort McMurray and we could be talking about how many cases of uh, COVID-19 there are currently in town right now, right? Or we could be talking about uh, Canada or, or just Keanu College or, you know, uh, whatever, but the prevalence, 
we could be talking about a number. We could say there are 300 people with COVID-19 in Alberta, or we could be talking about percentage. We could say 1% of the population, or we could be talking about uh, often what they do is they look at numbers per 100,000. That's kind of a useful metric. So they might say right now in Alberta, there are um, you know, 14 cases of COVID-19 per 100,000 in the population. And that way you can compare between provinces a lot easier when you have a common metric. Uh, percentages, when you're looking at very tiny things, percentages aren't useful. So per 100,000 is a per, usually a, a more useful metric. Um, incidence is the number of new cases, right? So if you think about COVID-19, we have, let's, let's say, just throw the number 300 cases, but the incidence is we have 50 new cases today. Right, so, so the overall, that means that the uh, prevalence is going to be 350 if you have 50 new cases. So these, these terms are kind of thrown out back and forth all the time, and that, that's really what they mean. Um, uh, it's not the kind of thing I usually ask on the, on the midterm, but it's the kind of language I might use in the lectures. Uh, so if you think about this, pre prevention can affect incidence, right? Um, and so that can ultimately affect prevalence or a cure or a treatment or deaths, right? All of these things will affect those, those, those things. And so this is the kind of thing, you know, we're looking at and you can see all these trends, you know, we're at the, where we are, we're at the peak of the fourth wave and all these kind of things. And, uh, you know, uh, trying to figure out what has actually been working, right? Um, right now, it looks like we're on the way down from this fourth wave. And um, in terms of, you know, it probably has had a lot to do with the, uh, the extreme lockdown measures that we that were implemented uh, I don't know when that was, three or four weeks ago. And, uh, you know, but long term, um, obviously, we're going to have a lot of data to be looking at and trying to, trying to really sort this out. Okay, so some more definitions for you endemic, epidemic, pandemic. These ones kind of drive me nuts because people use them incorrectly all the time. Uh, so let's define these, right? Endemic. Endemic is kind of just the normal natural pattern that you would see for a disease or something, right? And uh, I'll give you some examples in a moment. Epidemic is an increased number above the normal. And pandemic really just means it's an epidemic, but it's all over the place, right? So you might have, uh, well, let's just, we'll get into the examples here. So endemic, right? Disease that's kind of found there's a normal pattern Right? And so, for example, uh, influenza is something that's endemic in Canada. So every year in Canada, you know, we're expecting, um, you know, uh, a certain number of cases. Now, obviously, this is something that we don't really fully know the number of cases because not everyone gets diagnosed. Um, but around, around 1,200 hospitalizations and maybe 3,500 deaths in Canada annually, right? Uh, this last year has been kind of special. I think on every, every statistical table ever, is now going to have 2020 the little asterisk beside it because it's just a special year for, you know, special in the not positive sense. <laughs> um, but this is kind of expected, right? Now, if one year suddenly we had uh, 20,000 hospitalizations, that would then we would be concerned, right? But this is something that's kind of typical. Um, malaria is not endemic to Canada. Uh, as far as we know, we have zero cases of malaria that are transmitted in Canada per year. Right, um, we do get cases of malaria in Canada. They're imported. Someone was on holidays or visiting family or whatever, um, and they were in somewhere else, which is represented by these red zones. But if you are living or move or vacation in one of these red zones, then that is a malaria endemic location. And each of these is going to have their own things, right? Um, for example, uh, about about seventy five percent of the malaria cases are kind of in this uh, sub-Saharan band in Africa, right? If you're over here in, uh, in Malaysia, um, malaria is endemic in Malaysia, but the chances of you getting it a lot less likely. And so each place is gonna have kind of their own numbers and stats and on their, you know, the conditions and all those kind of things. So that's endemic, right? And so, you know, people are talking about, um, you know, this the SARS-CoV virus and, you know, uh, and people talking about, uh, is it endemic yet? Well, uh, right now we, I mean, the numbers are weird. So, uh, but at some point it will be endemic. We're not going to get rid of it. We're all going to have to live with it, get infected with it, and, and figure out how to live with it long term. That's going to be uh, part of the strategies moving forward. And, and there are discussions about that. 
Uh, so what's epidemic? Epidemic is more than usual, right? So if um, if suddenly, you know, there is, a, um, and this happens every couple of years, um, there was an outbreak of measles in one of our public schools. And so two cases of measles is considered an epidemic because the normal number of cases is zero. And that's all epidemic means. It means more than usual. Uh, here's some examples of epidemics. Um, the original SARS, this was 2002, 2003. Um, this was a brand new virus. It had never, ever been seen ever by humans. So when you're going from zero to whatever it was, that was epidemic. And uh, it's kind of funny, this slide here, um, I used to have it in my notes, and then suddenly everyone got too young to remember this. <laughs> so I got rid of it, and then now SARS is back, right? Uh, a new SARS virus. Um, but you can see there's some of the headlines, and uh, it was uh, restricted to a few locations, um, Hong Kong, China, a few play other places in, in Asia, I think uh, uh, the Koreas, um, I think it ended up in Hungary, a uh, few cases there, but uh, the kind of the big places were Toronto being one of them. And uh, talk to anyone who was living in Ontario at the time, it was it was a really big deal. And then disappeared, which is great. I like things disappearing. Uh, Ebola, uh, this pops up, I don't know, every two to five years there seems to be an Ebola outbreak. Uh, the big serious one was in 2014. I can't remember how many cases that was. I think it was 30 or 40,000 cases or something like that. I can't remember the exact numbers. Most Ebola epidemics are like less than 100. Um, so that one was quite significant. And it did spill out into a few locations. There was a case that ended up, uh, one or two cases ended up in the States. Uh, one or two cases ended up in different places in, in, in Europe. Um, and so of course it was, it was huge in the news. And uh, in fact, there's another epidemic going on right now in uh, um, not these countries, but in um, uh, the Democratic Re uh, Republic of the Congo, I believe is having Ebola epidemic. And then Zika, you may have heard of that one. Um, this, uh, if you take a look at this map, Zika uh, before 2007 was um, endemic to these regions. And you can see the blue, it's, uh, it's spreading to a few near areas, right? New areas. Um, and then at some point, I'm not exactly sure what happened. I don't, it looks like it actually went that way across the Pacific and ended up in the Americas. And so uh, of course this was hitting the news a lot. Uh, so that's an epidemic. Right. So pandemic, this is worldwide. Okay, maybe not every geographical location, but we are talking about worldwide. And here's some pandemics. So one of the most famous historical pandemics was the 1918 Spanish flu. Um, and this was uh, uh, this was a big deal. Uh, we're looking at maybe five percent of people who got it died from it. Could you imagine if that was the case uh, with this new virus? Uh, we would be looking at numbers that are uh, are many times larger than the magnitude they are now. Uh, this flu virus, um, this is an, a hangar, by the way, uh, where aircraft are normally kept, and it was made into a makeshift hospital uh, to try to deal with all these people. Uh, back then, we didn't know what a flu virus was. We suspected it was a viral infection, but it had never been isolated, and there was no treatment. A lot of people were actually dying from secondary infections like pneumonia. Uh, but the crazy thing about this is... Uh, Flu viruses tend to like places like Canada uh, and winters and cool places. Whereas this virus, it seemed to go everywhere. Like weird tropical islands who had never, people had never seen the flu before, it made it there. This was uh, more infectious and was making people more sick and was very scary. So in 2009, we had another H1N1 virus. This here, this here was an H1N1 virus, by the way. And in 2009, we had another H1M1 virus. It turned out it wasn't quite as virulent, um, but it had some of the same properties of the Spanish flu, meaning that um, it, uh, it seemed to, like, it go into tropical locations a lot easier. Uh, younger people were getting sicker, right? And so there was a big concern about this. So it turns out that influenza is much less infectious than people uh, think it is. Uh, it's actually very easily controlled with measures like washing hands and, uh, and, and those kind of things. And so uh, uh, here's some stats for this, right? Normally in Canada, about a quarter of the population gets their flu shot. Uh, this year, it was about 45%. And literally, once the, once the uh, flu shot uh, rolled out, I think it was three weeks later, the cases plummeted to almost zero. Um, that's what it takes for herd immunity for an influenza virus, 
uh, much, much less infectious. Uh, this last year and a half, uh, the number of cases, 3,500 deaths in Canada, I think we're in, in, the, in a few hundred, um, so much, much less. Uh, here's the map, it was pandemic worldwide. There's a lot of countries you don't have complete data for, um, but it was a big deal, of course, at the time. And so here we are, 2021. Okay, this is gonna be your lives if you pay attention to the news. There's epidemics every, there's always something, every, let's say, three to five years. Um, and if we're lucky, they don't become pandemic. Um, and this one here is pandemic. So uh, as of yesterday, um, that many cases, probably a lot more, obviously not everyone's getting tested. We don't have good data in most of Africa and Asia. Um, you know, they're dealing with other infections uh, and, and other issues. Uh, they don't have the money to keep up with it. Uh, whereas, you know, Canada or richer countries, we, we, you know, a little bit better at tracking these things. Uh, here we are in Canada. So apparently uh, we're close to 30,000 deaths over 18 months. So anyone who says it's just as bad as the flu, I think the data shows that it's not. It's maybe, it's, it's you know, almost 10 times as bad as the flu. Um, so anyway, those are some, some data. Uh, um, the question is, you know, are there, are there other deaths? You know, I think there's some people looking at, you know, um, other data in terms of there's probably people that have had it and then they die of other complications and whatnot. And so the numbers aren't perfect, but at least it gives you an idea. Where are we with time here? Okay, we're doing all right. Okay, so what about AIDS? Um, this is one of the things where we see uh, the language used uh, and all three of these words, I see them used uh, regarding AIDS. Okay, so if you take a look at this here, this is the years, right, the number of cases uh, worldwide, right? So early 80s, you're looking at an emergence of this disease, and uh, by the early 90s, um, it was it was out of control. And then uh, and then now, if you take a look, right, this is what is it, the 05. So this is kind of where we are in most countries with HIV and AIDS, is that we it was epidemic. And then now we have kind of, it's predictable. So every year in Canada, um, health officials are predicting there will be a certain number of new infections of HIV. And uh, that's a reality now. Uh, obviously, you know, we are trying to, uh, you know, educate people about safe sexual practices and whatnot, and, uh, you know, particularly target populations, um, you know, injection drug users, and uh, uh, men who have sex with men, those kind of are, are the highest risk populations in Canada. And they are the people that uh, much of the education outreach is going to, as well as young people, right? Uh, so it's technically endemic now, but not everyone likes that because endemic sounds like it's tame, right? And uh, particularly if you look at some countries in the world, um, so if you take a look at this here, this blue part of the, the pie chart in Sub-Saharan Africa, and they are carrying a heavy burden when it comes to HIV infection, right? And this is the total number of uh, infected people <clears throat> worldwide, actually. This is old data now. Not much has changed. Um, millions and millions of people. So a lot of people are still saying it's epidemic because they're remembering when it was zero, right? But in many of these countries, probably endemic is the correct word to use, but it just doesn't sound as dramatic. Right, and technically, when you look at these countries, um, I was looking at uh, data for uh, Uganda, for example, and uh, and and they actually had some pretty good programming for a while, and were sort of keeping it under control. And I'm not exactly sure what happened. I remember reading about it a few years ago. The programming or the government changed, and they took these different strategies, and the number of cases just went up, right? And a lot of it had to do with actually educating women, um, and. Uh, I, and I, I, like I said, I don't know all the details about it, but uh, so at that point when it goes up, it does become epidemic. In these countries, you see those kind of things all the time. Politically, uh, things change, philosophies change in terms of how and who to educate. Uh, money comes and money goes, and so things can change. And we're still hearing people talking about the AIDS or HIV pandemic uh, for that reason, like I said, is because it's a more dramatic word, um, and, uh, and we would love to see it under better control. Uh, but really probably the best word for AIDS, HIV now, is endemic. Um, whether the word is tamer or not, it doesn't necessarily mean anything, right? So notice these words, the last thing I wanted to say, these words have nothing to do with the severity of a disease. 
Okay, they just have to do with the number of cases. Okay, you could talk about, um, uh, you know, use these words. You could talk about, uh, you know, now we're hearing about talking about an obesity epidemic, right? Um, it just means that there's more people obese than, um, you know, whatever we think the baseline should be. Uh, you could talk about uh, an epidemic of uh, people playing Fortnite, right? I mean, it doesn't mean it's bad. Some people think yes, some people think no, it doesn't really matter. Um, it has to do with the numbers and the number of cases. Okay, um, let me just see where I'm at here. So there's our maps. Like I said, it has to do with number of cases and a little bit to do with geography, and uh, but not virulence. Probably a good place to stop, yeah. So I'm gonna stop there. And um, so we'll see you on Tuesday for the midterm. We'll pick up topic 11 um, after on um, the following Thursday.